Hello, my name's Peter Higginbotham, and today I'm going to be talking to you about the workhouse. A useful place to start the story is 1601, right at the end of Elizabeth I's reign. Parliament had just passed the 1601 Poor Relief Act, which became known as the Old Poor Law. What that did, very briefly, was to make the parish formally responsible for looking after its own poor people. What parishes did was to collect money from the householders in the parish, and that became known as the poor rates. In those days, most of the money was spent on out relief. Out relief is handouts. Whatever each poor person needed, whether it's clothing, fuel, bread, cash, was a portion of out relief. Now, if you were able-bodied and wanted a handout, you're expected to work for it. So some of the money could be spent on buying stocks of materials, wool, hemp, flax and so on, for the able-bodied poor to work on, spinning, weaving and so on, in return for their handout. There was also mention in 1601 of houses. Some of the money could be spent on housing the so-called blameless poor or helpless poor, the elderly, the chronically sick and so on, who even with the help of a handout, couldn't keep going by themselves. So we had work and we had houses. They hadn't quite joined together in 1601, but over the next century or so, you got the appearance of institutions that combined those two functions, housing the helpless poor and places where the able-bodied poor could go and work in return for their board and lodging. And some early institutions of this type uh, in some of the larger towns of the day, uh, Newbury, Reading, Sheffield, Newark, uh, Habingdon, Halifax, Leeds, and in the capital, uh, London and Middlesex uh, in the mid 17th century. Some of these workhouse buildings are still around. Uh, Newbury in Berkshire uh, had a fairly substantial workhouse and there's a portion of it still standing in the town. Uh, it's now a local museum, but this is one of the earliest surviving uh, former workhouse buildings. So what's the attraction of these new fangled workhouses? Well, as often in this life, it comes down to money and saving money. Many parishes adopted what was known as the workhouse test. You could say to your poor parishioners, no more handouts. Instead, we've now got a workhouse for you, but it's up to you. If you're prepared to come into this place, then by definition you're eligible to receive poor relief. And you'd find if you did that, the number of claimants would be reduced and the, so would the cost. There's also the appearance of privatisation. For a small parish, running a workhouse could be a bit of a chore. You had to find a building and furnish it and organise the food and the work and so on. So many parishes handed the whole job over to a private contractor or farmer who was paid so much a head per week for doing the whole messy job. And those two things could reduce the cost of looking after the poor. And there was a workhouse boom in the mid 1700s. Ratepayers all across the country were jumping up and down and saying, let's try a workhouse. By the 1770s, there were around 2000 parish workhouses in operation. About one in seven parishes had decided to set up a workhouse. Now that sounds a lot, but you have to remember that six out of seven parishes hadn't run a workhouse and out relief was always the dominant way of helping the poor. A typical workhouse of the day uh, was at St Albans and this report from 1724 gives a flavour of how, how it was run. There were 20 men and women aged from 50 to 80, year old, 80 years old. Um, they were employed in winding cotton wick for tallow chandlers, candle makers. There were also children of the workhouse, 10 boys and four girls aged from four to 14. The boys made horse whips for jockeys and the girls s were spinning linen and woolen. An old building, so workhouses just often recycled buildings, uh, turned into workhouses. Uh, this one, 100 people uh, could be accommodated. So a, a fairly substantial establishment. Often reasonably well fed. Uh, they had meat 
on four days a week, four flesh days as they were called, which was typical of workhouses of the period. And the parish uh, had discovered that over a four year period, the poor rates had been halved. And that really uh, was the, the essence um, of why you, you should want to run a workhouse. One of the few surviving workhouse buildings in central London is the former St Paul's Covent Garden Parish Workhouse on Cleveland Street. Uh, recent research has shown this was almost certainly uh, the workhouse used by Charles Dickens as the model uh, for the workhouse in Oliver Twist. Uh, Charles Dickens lived quote, close by for a while. Parish workhouses varied quite a lot in their conditions and the workhouse diet is often a very good guide to exactly how comfortable they were. Uh, amongst the most comfortable uh, was Brighton. This is the workhouse diet there from 1834. Uh, breakfast every day, the men had bread and gruel, uh, women a pint of tea and bread and butter. Uh, in the evening supper rather similar, uh, although the men uh, got a pint of beer or tea to drink and the women a pint of tea. And the midday dinner uh, boiled beef, mutton, puddings, bread, vegetables, a pint of beer. Even the children uh, got a ration of beer. Uh, peas, soup, herbs, bread and beer, beef and mutton, puddings again, vegetables and beer and so on. And Saturday uh, Irish stew, potatoes and beer uh, for dinner. So quite a, a decent uh, dinner to have to finish the week off. Now parishes weren't obliged to support any poor person who came their way. Uh, entitlement to, to poor relief was based on something called settlement, the parish to which you legally belonged. Everyone had a home parish uh, where they were settled and settlement was based uh, ultimately on your father's settlement, typically the place where you were born. Now in 1662 parishes were given the power to physically eject new arrivals who they thought might end up claiming poor relief at some point in the future. Uh, this is a situation with very strong modern resonances uh, for us today. The rules of settlement were very complicated. Uh, for example, your settlement could change during your life. Uh, if a woman married, she took on her husband's settlement. Um, or if you were apprenticed, you took on the settlement of the place of your apprenticeship. It's been said in recent times that settlement is the possibly the worst law ever passed by British Parliament. The only people who benefited were the legal profession, sorting out all the complications and twists and turns over the years. And settlement was only finally removed from the statute book in 1948 with the introduction of the welfare state. If you're researching the old poor law, the parish workhouse era, there's various records you may find of interest and most of these will be held at local county or metropolitan record offices if they survive. Uh, first of all there's overseers accounts. The overseers were the parish officials that collected the poor rate and also dispensed poor relief to claimants. Poor rate ledgers recorded all the payments by households into the poor rates and any non-payers or late payers uh, might receive a summons, a bit of paper demanding payment. On the outgoing side, uh, out relief payments to individuals would all be carefully recorded. And the whole uh, administration of the parish was in the hands of the vestry, the parish committee, and their minutes uh, may contain references to any workhouse that was in operation. The whole business of settlement and removal generated a lot of paperwork. Uh, for example, if you ever needed to prove uh, where you were settled, then you might obtain a settlement certificate. If you were removed uh, to back to another parish, again, paperwork would be involved in that process. And if you were involved in a dispute uh, about where your settlement was, then uh, a settlement examination in front of a magistrate might be required. Uh, we've got one uh, over here uh, from Shropshire and you get details of a person's basically life history, uh, all of which could uh, count towards their current state of settlement. You don't get many workhouse specific documents surviving. Um, most of the business relating to workhouses appears in other documents that I've mentioned above. 
Things changed dramatically with the arrival of the new Poor Law in the shape of the 1834 Poor Law Amendment Act. Uh, the new system introduced a new administrative area uh, known as the Poor Law Union. The Poor Law Union was a collection of parishes, typically 20 or 30 um, around a market town. Each union was run locally by a committee known as the Board of Guardians, elected by the ratepayers in the area. So the, the ratepayers were still going to be paying for the new system, but they had their voice through the Board of Guardians. Each union was expected to provide a large workhouse to serve the whole union area. And the new workhouses were intended to be deterrent, unattractive, uncomfortable places. You would rather be outside than inside. And the aim of the new system was to put an end to the growing burden of out relief, uh, which was afflicting the ratepayers of the country. If you were able bodied, uh, then it would be the workhouse or nothing. The workhouse test was back in a big way. And the new system was intended to be uniform across the whole country. Uh, wherever you went, it would be the same, uh, unlike the parish system, which varied according to where you were in the country. So how did these new workhouses operate? Well, first of all, entry into a union workhouse was essentially a voluntary process. You weren't put in the workhouse, you were offered the workhouse or you resorted to the workhouse. If you had a family, then the family had to stick together. Uh, so the father couldn't leave his family outside while he went into the workhouse. And equally, uh, if he left, uh, he couldn't leave them behind uh, while he went out. When you arrived at the workhouse, there was a long admission procedure. Uh, you had a bath and a medical. And then you couldn't go into the workhouse if you were carrying anything infectious and smallpox was a very big concern in, in those days. And you were given a workhouse uniform. When you wanted to leave the workhouse, you could leave any time you wanted in principle. It wasn't a prison. However, you couldn't just wander out the door when you felt like it. If you left the premises without permission, wearing your uniform, you could be charged with stealing union property and get a month's hard labour. You could, however, though, leave for a short period with permission to look for work or to attend a, a family funeral uh, or those kind of things. The thing though, that people hated most about the workhouse uh, system was what was called classification and segregation. As soon as you went through the door, you were put in a box, or metaphorically and almost literally. Uh, you were divided into different groups, male, female, elderly and infirm, able-bodied and children, and the various combinations of those things. And each of those groups was allocated its own separate section of the workhouse. And until you left the workhouse, you had very little contact with other people in different groups. So if a family entered, the father would go one way, the mother another way, and the children, unless they were very small, would go to the children's section of the building. So here we have a typical workhouse of the period, the Greenwich Union Workhouse, opened in 1840. At the front, uh, we've got the entrance block, where would, there would have been a porter's lodge, and the guardians would have had their meeting room above. And there would also have been accommodation, uh, short-term accommodation for new arrivals uh, at the workhouse. Uh, behind that, all the other buildings will be divided uh, down the middle, male on one side and female on the other. At the centre of the main building, the master and matron uh, would have had their quarters and each side would be further subdivided. Uh, usually the children uh, were in the front portion uh, uh, of the buildings and the adults at the rear would have been divided into able-bodied and elderly and infirm. At the rear of the site would have been the workhouse infirmary with medical care for the inmates and also uh, sometimes provision for mental illness cases. The space between the buildings was carved up by walls, seven foot high walls, creating exercise yards for the different categories of inmate. And all the doors and corridors in the building would have been arranged so that each group 
had access to its own yard, but with no contact with other groups. I mention workhouse uniforms, and here are some inmates of the Bosmir and Claydon Union workhouse at Barham in Norfolk. Uh, the ladies at the front are wearing the a typical women's uniform, uh, a long uh, gown made of um, blue and white striped cotton material uh, traditionally, uh, with an apron, shawl and bonnet. Uh, the men are uh, wearing their sort of jacket, waistcoat and trousers. Uh, many workhouses, uh, the women made their own uniforms. It was one of the, the, the jobs given for the women to, uh, to carry out. The daily routine in the workhouse was quite uh, onerous, if you were able-bodied at least. Uh, in summer, you're up at 6am, breakfast and prayers through till 7, and then five hours work through till dinner time. An hour for dinner, and then five more hours work through till 6, supper and prayers six till seven and then bed nice and early at eight o'clock. Uh, in the winter it was exactly the same uh, except you have an extra hour in bed for the dark mornings. So what did they have to eat in a union workhouse? Was it really gruel gruel gruel? This is one of the sample diet plans issued in 1835 for able-bodied workhouse inmates. Uh, breakfast Every single day of the week was bread and gruel. Eight ounces of bread and a pint and a half of lovely gruel. At supper, again, every single day of the week it was the same, bread and cheese. It was the midday dinner that varied a little bit, although most days, again, it was bread and cheese. Tuesday, though, was the highlight of the week. You actually got some cooked meat and vegetables. A Thursday, a bit of soup. Saturday a bit of bacon, but basically it was bread and gruel, bread and cheese, bread and cheese, bread and gruel, bread and cheese, bread and cheese, bread and gruel, oh, Tuesday, mm-mm. At the bottom uh, there's a note, uh, the elderly uh, could trade in their gruel if they wished, and who wouldn't, uh, for some tea, butter and sugar. Uh, the dried tea meant they could brew up uh, whatever they wanted to. Now it's very easy to get the impression of the workhouse as being frozen in time uh, in the days of Oliver Twist. However, things did change and food is a very good example of that. We've now moved forward to about 1900. This is the St Pancras workhouse in London, uh, the ladies dining hall. And if you look uh, what's on the plates of the ladies on the front row, there's rather more now than just bread and cheese. So by 1900, the food had improved. Unless, of course, it was Tuesday when the picture was taken. But in 1900, uh, things had changed. The workhouse was not full of idle layabouts. It was full of the elderly, the chronically sick, the mentally ill, uh, single mothers, children. And a lot of those people literally couldn't swallow eight ounces of bread and, and an ounce and a half of cheese two or three times a day. And a lot of it was just being thrown away because you got your full ration whether you were hungry or not. So in 1900 it was decided to improve workhouse food. Um, it would be better for the health and morale and of course also reduce the wastage. So a new menu system was introduced where each workhouse could choose its own weekly menu plan and there was a list of about 50 different dishes approved for the purpose. Treats such as Irish stew and roly-poly pudding came onto the menu. Being a workhouse, work was expected of those inmates uh, who could physically perform it. Uh, for the women, it was mostly the domestic duties of running the establishment, cleaning, laundry, cooking, sewing, uh, scrubbing and so on. The men, though, didn't have an easy time of it. Uh, they were employed in things like stone breaking, uh, oakum picking, that's teasing apart old ropes into their raw fibres. But as time went on and the inmates on average got older, lighter work uh, became more common. Gardening and chopping firewood was very popular. You could very quickly see how much someone had done and also the, the firewood could be sold locally to householders and generate a, a bit of income. The elderly and infirm were not required to work, so the workhouse was not a labour camp, if you like. 
Laundry work was uh, very common for the ladies uh, doing the weekly wash for the workhouse or the bedding and, and uh, linen and also the workhouse uniforms. And here are some ladies, not very laboriously, it has to be admitted, uh, demonstrating oakum picking. You start off with a big chunk uh, of, uh, of solid rope, you tease it apart and you end up uh, with a big pile of uh, fluff on the floor which could be sold uh, for, and uh, reused for various purposes. As well as the full-time inmates, every workhouse provided accommodation for passing tramps and vagrants who were known as casuals. They could receive a night's accommodation in return for doing some work and oakum picking and stone breaking were the two most popular tasks. This illustration shows a stone breaking cell which some workhouses had. The vagrant was placed inside with a supply of rock, a hammer and the stone had to be broken into bits small enough to go through a grid in the wall to the outside world and when all the stone had gone through he could go on his way. The medical facilities in the workhouse uh, is an interesting and important part of the, uh, the workhouse story. Um, up until the 1860s the workhouse was probably the worst place in the world to get sick. Um, the buildings often very cramped and badly ventilated and the nursing was often done by elderly female inmates who often couldn't read and write um, and couldn't read instructions on bottles or uh, instructions uh, from the medical officer. There was though a great move to improve conditions from the 1860s onwards. Uh, train nurses. Uh, Florence Nightingale, for example, was very uh, active in promoting the training of workhouse nurses. And new buildings uh, were erected increasingly from the 1860s, 70s onwards. The thing that revolutionised the medical care in workhouses was access by non-inmates. From the 1870s, 1880s onwards, um, if you were sick and poor, then you would increasingly be referred to the workhouse for medical treatment. You wouldn't need to go into the workhouse as an inmate first, you could just go and directly use the workhouse infirmary. And as a result of that, the workhouse became the local hospital in many places. And the staff also increased, new buildings were put up, and in many places the workhouse medical facilities uh, almost outgrew the, the accommodation for the poor that they offered. And in a very true way, the workhouse infirmary was a major foundation of the National Health Service when it began life in 1948. The practice of free medical care for those in need was now long established and a large chunk of uh, National Health Service real estate uh, was former workhouse infirmaries. If you're researching workhouses or workhouse inmates, there's plenty to go at. First of all, civil registration records, uh, births and death records in particular. Uh, marriages didn't take place in workhouses, but births and deaths uh, were recorded in the usual way. From 1904, you will not see the word workhouse on a birth certificate of someone who was born there. Uh, to try and remove the stigma from being born in the workhouse, uh, the Registrar General uh, issued um, a uh, instruction allowing workhouses to use a anonymous or pseudonymous street address um, to place on birth certificates. So for example, the Manchester workhouse uh, was recorded as being 123 Crescent Road, Crumpsall. Um, and the person who reported the birth was recorded as being the occupier rather than the workhouse master uh, as had previously been the practice. And the same uh, principle was later extended to death certificates of people dying in the workhouse uh, in around 1920. The census, of course, uh, records uh, workhouse inmates um, 
And again, uh, if you're trying to track down uh, a workhouse entry in the census records, uh, it can take a bit of finding um, unless you have a particular reference um, because the word workhouse often doesn't appear in the uh, the name of the uh, establishment. The word union actually is a much better thing to search for uh, on the whole. And um, the location of a workhouse may not be in the, the main town um, after which the union is named. So the Bolton workhouse uh, in Lancashire uh, is actually located um, at Fishpool in the parish of Farnworth, uh, rather than the word Bolton uh, being mentioned. If you're searching census records on Find My Past, there's a very useful facility in the house name filter. Uh, you can start typing part of the, the name, uh, Union in this case, and here's a list of the hits that it's found. So you've got Anglesey Union Workhouse, workhouse split into two words. Uh, Ashbourne Union Workhouse, Aston Union Workhouse, Atcham Union House. Uh, that is the workhouse even though the word work doesn't appear in the name. And below that we've got Atcham Union Warehouse. That's obviously a transcription error. Uh, so a very useful facility to help you track down a particular workhouse census. And in the census itself, lots of interesting information, of course. We're going to look at the Berry Workhouse Census for 1881. We've got 12 resident staff, the master and matron, porter and portress, cook, clerk, schoolmistress and five nurses. And interestingly, there were four married couples amongst the staff. The master and matron, the porter and portress, uh, the cook was married to one of the nurses and the clerk was married to a nurse. We've got 622 inmates in residence. And there are certain groups you almost always get amongst a workhouse population. Uh, first of all, we've got the uh, unmarried mill worker or domestic servant uh, with one, two, three children uh, in tow. In this case, Sarah Fleming with James and Albert. Albert actually born in the Union workhouse. Uh, single mothers often find it very difficult to support themselves uh, and do childcare at the same time and often ended up in the workhouse. And the same also applied to widowed uh, women with small children. Rachel Kershaw, widowed, again a cotton weaver and three children, uh, ended up in the workhouse. You could however live to a ripe old age in the workhouse. We've got 86 inmates aged 70 or over. 45 men and 31 women, and a 92-year-old amongst them. You almost always find more elderly men than elderly women in the workhouse, and that's usually put down to elderly women, even if they're poor, being much better at staying independent yeah, in, in their old age. And we've also got 172 inmates labelled as having handicaps, 81 lunatics, 81 imbeciles, four idiots, four deaf and dumb, and two blind inmates. If you're not familiar with the terminology, uh, lunatic uh, means mentally ill, and imbeciles and idiots were two of the standard labels for people uh, with intellectual impairment, what we'd now call severe learning difficulties. Uh, idiot, idiocy was the more severe condition uh, and imbecility uh, a less severe form. The National Archives at Kew in West London has some interesting records. Uh, first of all, there's the Union Correspondence Files. This is all the daily correspondence between every workhouse and the central authorities. A very large amount of, uh, of documents. A little bit of that's now been digitised for certain unions, um, but majority uh, that's not taken place yet. Uh, Q also has uh, comprehensive staff lists for every union, uh, for each post. Uh, there's the name of every incumbent, uh, dates of starting and finishing, uh, reasons for leaving, um, salary and so on and so on. Also at Q there's a large collection of large-scale workhouse plans, architectural plans, for very many workhouses. So if you're interested in the buildings uh, themselves, uh, then that's a very good resource. Uh, for all the material at Q, their main uh, catalogue, discovery.nationalarchives.gov.uk, 
www.thepodcast.co.uk is a very uh, valuable resource. It covers not only material at Q itself, but also what the holdings from a large number of other archives around the country. Local record offices, that's uh, county record offices and metropolitan record offices, uh, keep uh, all the surviving local records from workhouses and poor law unions. Board of Guardians minutes are the things that most often survive. That's the minutes of the Guardian's weekly or fortnightly uh, meetings, uh, largely uh, administrative and financial um, business. Uh, occasionally the minutes include uh, names or even lists uh, of, work uh, of workhouse inmates, although that's uh, not something that happens all that often. Um, the admission and discharge books of the workhouse uh, for family history uh, research are probably one of the main resources you'll be interested in looking at with the, the dates of admission um, and, uh, and leaving uh, the workhouse and uh, a little bit more information. The Creed Register, introduced in 1869, uh, is a particularly valuable research resource. Um, it includes uh, admission and discharge uh, information and in the Creed Register they're linked. In the admission and discharge books uh, they're in independently listed. The whole book is in chronological order. In the Creed Register uh, you get an entry which covers both um, admission and leaving together with in other information, uh, religious uh, denomination as you may imagine but often also uh, other information for example details of next of kin uh, or an address, uh, previous address that the inmate uh, may have been living at. The uh, indoor relief lists uh, are a six monthly summary of every inmate that was in the workhouse uh, for any, any length of time. Um, it was used to um, charge parishes for their contribution to the running uh, of the uh, of the union. Um, so it's a, a, a very, again a very comprehensive resource if it survives. Register of births and deaths uh, and baptisms. Uh, baptisms only carried out at the workhouse usually if it had its own proper chapel otherwise baptisms would be carried out at the local uh, parish church. Burials, uh, medical relief, uh, any, anyone getting treatment uh, in the workhouse infirmary would feature in the medical relief book. The Porter's book, all the comings and goings through the workhouse front door uh, recorded uh, and lots of other uh, records, uh, punishment books, clothing registers, all sorts of um, things were recorded. Uh, the important thing to appreciate about workhouse records is their survival is very, very variable. Uh, some places have a large amount of material surviving, other places virtually nothing. It's very hit and miss um, about what, where things have survived and where not. Again, the National Archive Discovery Catalogue uh, is a very good starting point. Um, many record offices have their own local catalogues, um, but um, a lot of that information is also duplicated in the Discovery Catalogue. There is of course an increasing amount of workhouse information available online. Uh, Find My Past has a growing collection of records. Uh, to see what they've got if you go to the main search menu, uh, choose A to Z of record sets and enter something appropriate. Workhouse for example, you'll see a list of what's available. And we've got things like the Berry Workhouse Admission, Creed, Discharge Registers, uh, Workhouses in Cheshire, Baptisms, Births, Burials and Death Records. Uh, religious creeds, Derbyshire, Lincolnshire, Manchester records and even some Irish records now as part of the collection. Some other useful sources, uh, first of all parliamentary papers. Uh, these are the large volumes of reports and other information presented to Parliament each year and uh, parliamentary papers going way back contain a surprising amount of information relating to individuals and institutions such as workhouses. Uh, 
Parliamentary papers can be searched online, uh, but they're really only via an institutional uh, subscription. So you'll need to go to a record office or maybe an educational institution you belong to uh, that has a subscription. Uh, local newspapers, of course, are a very interesting source of information, either in physical printed copies or through an online source such as the British Newspaper Archive. And if you have uh, a Find My Past subscription, you'll have access to that archive as part of your subscription. And finally, the poor law trade press. Um, like most uh, professions and uh, businesses, the poor law had its own trade press for officials and staff working in the system. And some of the publications in the trade press, again, have interesting information, sometimes relating to individuals. So some examples of some of those items. Uh, first of all, we've got a parliamentary uh, report from 1861, which recorded by name every single workhouse inmate in the country who'd been in residence for at least five years. Uh, this is a little section of the Stoke Dameral uh, workhouse population. Um, for each person, we've got a, a name, the number of years and months that they'd have been in residence, and the reason that was given uh, for their continued stay there. Uh, Elizabeth Sale has a remarkable 48 years in the workhouse, and rather a, a depressing list of reasons that could confine you to the workhouse, uh, widowhood, physical ailments, paralysis, uh, unemployment, having illegitimate children, uh, uh, insanity of wife, and laziness. So here's a nice story from a local newspaper. This is the Berry Workhouse Scandal in 1857, uh, a report about the governor of the workhouse, Mr. Bretarg, uh, charged with employing the porter in duties other than those for which he was appointed. Uh, it was reported that the governor was frequently drunk, uh, articles were fraudulently removed from the workhouse, and that there were more paupers on the books than were to be found at the workhouse. Uh, presumably this was a way of him getting uh, extra uh, income uh, or payments for feeding these fictitious inmates. Uh, lots more colourful detail. Um, the porter recorded all the ins and outs uh, of the master's coming and goings, that uh, he apparently thrashed the matron for being drunk, uh, and so on and so on and so on. All really uh, fascinating stuff um, that local newspapers specialise in reporting. And here's an example of the Poor Law Trade Press, the Poor Law Union's Gazette, which is also available in the British Newspaper Archive. It was published for about 50 years and it consists uh, entirely of wanted ads uh, for renegade men who deserted their families and left them uh, to be provided for by the local Poor Law Union. And there are some wonderful little pen uh, descriptions of the individuals in question. Here we've got John Rowlands of Llanarmon, a miner, 24 years old, 5 feet 7, stout, curly red hair, mark on the left eye, fond of drink, all sorts of lovely details about his physical appearance and character. And what a lovely uh, pen portrait to have if he happened to be an ancestor of yours. When did the workhouse disappear? Uh, is a question that often uh, comes up. Well, there isn't an entirely uh, simple answer to this question. Um, first of all, the boards of guardians that ran the workhouse system from 1834 onwards uh, were abolished in 1930, and their responsibilities were passed on to local councils, county councils and county borough councils, um, who took over poor relief and also inherited uh, the workhouse institutions. Uh, under council control, the majority of former workhouses uh, became, or were, perhaps you might say they were rebranded uh, as public assistance institutions or PAIs, or in some cases uh, became local hospitals or even split uh, into those two functions, part hospital 
and part uh, public assistance institution. Um, what's the difference between a public assistance institution and a workhouse? Uh, not a lot is the usual uh, picture you get. Um, very little seemed to change uh, under council control and in fact local people invariably carried on calling them you know, the workhouse uh, as they had been doing uh, prior to that. 1948 uh, most public assistance institutions either became part of the National Health Service uh, often as geriatric um, units or hospitals uh, and a number the smaller ones in particular uh, often held on to by local councils and used as old people's homes uh, from, for, for many years to come. Um, most of the surviving workhouse buildings uh, have now been converted to residential use but um, lots of other uses have been found for them, schools, uh, factories, warehouses uh, and some still are part of hospital um, sites. So what can we say about the workhouse? Was it as bad as it's often painted? Well, first of all, workhouses were deliberately monotonous, strict, uncomfortable, tedious places. Um, but they weren't really the, the harsh, cruel places that they seem to sometimes be depicted as. Over the years, there were enormous improvements in conditions for the inmates. By the 1890s, the elderly were getting weekly handouts of snuff, uh, tobacco, uh, books and newspapers provided, trips to the countryside and the seaside, uh, local people would come and do concerts. The medical care had improved enormously, uh, the food had improved enormously, lots of things had improved. But the thing though that never changed was the shame of the workhouse, the stigma of the workhouse. It, for most people it was really the worst place in the world you could ever be. If you're interested in former workhouse buildings there's a number uh, of former workhouses you can visit. Uh, there are dedicated workhouse museums uh, at Southwell or Southern if you prefer at Nottinghamshire that's now run by the National Trust and a very fine workhouse museum at Ripon in, in North Yorkshire. Uh, at Guildford, a uh, slightly different angle, uh, they've got the surviving Tramps Block, or Spike uh, as it was popularly known in its day, uh, preserved. And again, a very interesting building um, to visit. Uh, a number of other museums based in former workhouse buildings, although uh, their displays cover other topics other than the workhouse story, uh, even though that may feature uh, in, their, uh, in their exhibits. So Gresson Hall Farm and Workhouse in Norfolk, uh, Weaver Hall, uh, Northwich Cheshire, the Vestry House Museum at Walthamstow, Nidderdale Museum at Pateley Bridge, the Thackeray Medical Museum in Leeds and the Red House uh, Museum at Christchurch in, in Dorset. If you're interested in this subject um, then a very useful resort is my own website workhouses.org.uk uh, which has information on virtually every workhouse uh, site in the British Isles uh, and also a lot of uh, background information, information on records uh, and so on. And uh, over the years I've produced a number of books on the subject uh, which I've listed there, everything from the cookbook uh, to the encyclopedia uh, and the grim and gruesome tales uh, from the workhouse.